Welcome to the All of Life podcast from Redemption Church Tempe, where we have conversations on faith, culture, theology, and beyond to help us live all of life, all for Jesus. Let's jump into today's episode. Welcome to the All of Life podcast, where we believe that all of life is all for Jesus. My name is Josh Butler. I'm one of the lead pastors here at Redemption Tempe, and I am really excited about this special episode that we have coming up today. As regathering picks up momentum nationally and here at Redemption as well, regathering meaning churches are gathering again more live and in person, we want to look today at why regathering is significant, why gathering together as the people of God in person is significant. I'm excited we got a good friend of mine, a guy named Jay Kim, who wrote an excellent book called Analog Church. Why We Need Real People, Places, and Things in the Digital Age. And we're going to be interviewing Jay, just asking questions around what have we been missing out on this last year, year and a half, as uh, we haven't been able to gather in the ways that we've historically been used to. What are we missing out on? Uh, and why, as the opportunity arises, as, as we feel ready and able to uh, gather again in person, why is that significant? Why historically, theologically, Biblically, uh, do we need real people, places, and things? Because we're going to see it can be tempting to start to view church as something that you can just kind of digitally download, right? Like uh, downloading the information, an information download of a sermon or uh, the kind of worship music I can download and going, no, there's actually something theologically and historically and foundationally significant to being able to gather again as the people of God. And we've been missing out on that in this last season, but for those who are able to and for those who who can, we're excited to be pressing in into the season ahead into uh, this momentum of gathering in person again. And so I want to invite you to Listen to this upcoming interview with Jay with kind of that grid on, kind of thinking through with your ears open to like, man, why is this significant both to God and to our life as a people uh, that we could be together in person as the people of God again? I hope you enjoy it. Uh, but man, there's no person I, I'd rather have on to, to talk about this than Jay. So Jay, so stoked that you're here and with us, man. Yeah, man. So so glad to be here. Josh is... Uh... It, you're a hero of mine in so many ways, man. So I'm honored to honored to be on and Redemption Tempe. You're uh, lucky to have Josh with you guys. I, I wish Josh was with us, but you guys have him. So, <laughs> oh man, well thanks, dude. Well, actually, maybe fun. It would be first. It would be fun first to just kind of talk about how we know each other, man. I, I yeah. think where you and I first met back in the day was actually the regeneration conference that you and Dan Kimball yep. and others would lead and put on. And that's just been a phenomenal research. Can you maybe just share briefly, like what, what's regeneration? What, what, yeah. How do you, I remember first meeting you there as we were trying to equip next generation, uh, younger generations that are wrestling with some of the tough topics of the faith and tough topics in, in the Bible yeah. and getting to be one of the speakers there. And we just kind of hit it off and had a blast yeah. after that. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that that was right? like, yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. I think, gosh, that had to have been at least, seven years ago, six, seven years ago. And uh, we were up in Portland at the same event, the Regeneration Forum event. And uh, Josh was speaking there and I was doing some like video interviews. So I remember I emailed you, we didn't even know each other, but I emailed you and you were so gracious and we hung out, hit it off. And uh, yeah, there you go. Our relationship was off and running. But yeah, (laughs) the Regeneration Project, yeah, it's still going. Uh, It's a ministry of Western Seminary. And you know, you and I both have deep, deep connections with friends there. And um, you said it, man, it's just, you know, our desire is to help equip uh, followers of Jesus and local churches um, to be able to confidently uh, tell the story of God in a way that's really compelling. And in the face of like really unique and mounting and increasing challenges to following Jesus, you know, in our cultural moment with um, so many questions about, you know, faith and, and God and the Bible. And, uh, and you have been a, a huge part of the Regeneration Project, but also like your work. Um, I, I, dude, I, I distinctly remember uh, when you wrote Skeletons in God's Closet, that was just like such a game changer mm. um, for us at Regen and for so many people at our church. And we've had you out 
to our church yes. several times yeah. to speak on different things um, from, from that book and, and other topics as well. So there you go. Yeah, we, you and I have regeneration to thank for our uh, our budding friendship. So. That's awesome, man. <laughs> well, dude, I also got to say, quick note before we jump in, man, since I saw you last pre-COVID, your, your hair game is strong, dude. Like for those who are watching oh, online on YouTube right now, it looks so good. Uh, so we have a mutual friend, Dan Kimball, a pastor in uh, Santa Cruz area who uh dude yeah the wave kind of like dude it looks so good and I yeah. was just re- <laughs> I, I was just remembering I, I was just remembering one time Dan Kimball our, our, our mutual friend who has, has kind of a similar style he had taken a, a picture of myself Scott McKnight who's bald and Dan, who's got the same hair, you know, kind of the, 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 high, the high surfer wave like, like you got. And, but he chopped off that we were all together at this conference and he chopped off the bottom of our face. So all you could see was the top of our heads. And you kind of had to guess which person was which. Like, you know, and, and what was it? He had a little tagline, a motto with it. What was it? Again? Yeah, it was like, uh, the higher the hair, the closer to God. <laughs> there we go. There we go. <laughs> yeah, I, think that, I think that's bad theology, but he, he could be right. I don't know. <laughs> well, you may be closer to me. You, 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 may, you may have me beat now. We're, we're competing for height here. I'm drawing near to the Lord, dude. That's I'm right. Drawing near to the heavens above. Awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, man, let's jump in. So, Obviously, this last year uh, and beyond, man, uh, one of the realities of COVID uh, for churches around the country has been um, restrictions on uh, our ability to gather in person. And I think uh, wisdom and other people, well, like different different states. So you're in California. Things have been a little bit different there than Arizona. But just even talking with friends around the country and where all of us have had to navigate uh, life during COVID and being the church together, being the people of God together during COVID. I know for us, uh, you know, we had a, a long season that was only online or, you know, a season in 2020. And then, um, beginning in the summer, kind of late summer, we moved to having both outdoor services and then gradually indoor we kind of found ourselves in the squared spot where we've had both online outdoor gatherings and indoor gatherings three simultaneously, you know? Uh, and now I, I'm curious, can you, I'm just curious from your perspective, Jay, yeah, what, what have you seen both at your church and then even just this last year? Um, d- dig us into what is some of the realities that we've been facing during COVID and what is some of what we've been missing or maybe some of the unanticipated costs of just the loss of being able to gather and be together in person? Yeah, that's a great question, Josh. I mean, I, I think I always, me personally, I, I always valued <laughs> embodied presence. Um, but I, I don't think I valued it nearly enough. So this past year, you know, we saw like showing up and being at a place before COVID. I think, uh, we saw it, you know, very rarely as a privilege. We always saw it either as an opportunity, uh, or often saw it as sort of a hassle or a nuisance. You know, I, I do think a lot of people, um, saw church that way, <laughs> you know? Mm. So when, the advent of sort of online services and all of that started rising uh, long before COVID, people were sort of rejoicing. You know, like, mm-hmm. man, this is great. I could just kind of stay at home in my PJs and do my thing. And, and I understand that online services and digital church is not just all for that. I think that there are really beautiful reasons why it's helpful for some, mm-hmm. you know, even ways that I haven't thought about until mm. the past year, you know, I'm thinking about like shut-ins, people who are mm. compromised physically with health and all those things, man, at mm-hmm. least we have, that, you know, folks yes. stay connected. or like when we're traveling, you know, we're away, but man, our church home is our family and we want to keep tracking with what's going on. That's a real gift to be able to go online and, and keep tracking with, with your community But I think for so many of us before COVID, the online stuff wasn't really a a gift. It was just like a a great, um, you know, convenience, really. It was just like, ah, this is great. Like, I don't have to get dressed. I don't have to get my kids ready. I'll just pop it on. Sermon's kind of going in the background while I'm cooking breakfast. And it's, you know, I've got church or whatever. And I think what COVID has done for so many people, and I think in some ways, although it's been hard, this has been a good thing. Um, it's, it's probably deepened our awareness of our absolute need for embodied presence, not just with the church, but just in life, you know, mm. 
pretty early on during COVID, we were seeing left and right people tweet about and write about and talk about Zoom fatigue and digital fatigue and um, the world of psychology started deep diving into like, why is this happening? Why are we so exhausted by being on digital screens all the time? And the reality, I mean, to summarize the data, the reality is like embodied people need embodied people. It's just an undeniable w- reality of the way God has designed us. And, you know, secular um, secularism would say the, the way our bi- biology, you know, is sort of hardwired into us. We just need people. So um, I, there's a lot to say here, but I think that's one of the things that has, and maybe the most prominent thing that's sort of bubbled to the surface. And at the same time, I think for churches, we face a great challenge because although we've deepened our awareness of embodied, pre- our awareness of the need for embodied presence, this past year has also habituated us and formed us in uh, new ways and in, in many ways in unwanted ways. You know, um, Jamie Smith uh, talks about how, how people are liturgical animals, you know, and you could argue the, the, word animals there, but we are liturgical in the sense that we are people who are formed and habituated by our work, by our actions, by our rhythms. And an entire year of not having to go to church, not being with other people has certainly formed us. And uh, we've got some work ahead, I think, to unform and then become reformed uh, into the church. Wow, that's great, man. Well, yeah, what would you say? So you've written this great book, Analog Church. And uh, man, I, I don't have it in front. Can you remind me of the subtitle? It had a great subtitle. Yeah, it's just uh, why we need real people, places, and things in the digital age. Great. So, yes, yeah, so Analog Church, why we need real people, places, and things in the digital age. And one of these I love you talk about in there is the difference between uh, why we, we – the difference between relevance and transcendence, how so often, even as churches, we can kind of be – um, pursuing relevance, but actually what's more significant and what there's a real hunger for today is transcendence. And so could you talk about it a little bit? What, what is that difference, that distinction between relevance versus transcendence? And um, not only from the perspective of why we as churches should be seeking to cultivate spaces of transcendence or the relevance, but also for those who haven't maybe been gathering in person for a while and, or, you know, like why, why is embodied gathering together in person significant to a transcendence and encounter? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, you know, relevance and transcendence, those, those words are, they're big words. So they have, you know, sort of a breadth of meaning, but I think what, what I intend in using those words is to, to talk about, um, by relevance, what, what I want to be careful here. What I don't mean is that churches shouldn't be relatable. We should be to irrelevant. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying, let's keep relevance. Yeah. Like just sermons that have nothing to do with anyone's lives. Or, yes. and, and that's not what I mean at all. I mean, of course, the gospel is good news for our lives, for our world. Like you guys say, like all of life, you know, all of life. Yeah. Um, Jesus and the good news he brings to bear has something to say about all of life. So certainly we've got to be relevant to, to, to the actual lived lives of the people in our community. What I mean by relevance is I'm talking very specifically about sort of the red hot pursuit of cultural and specifically like digital social media age relevance. So what I mean is when churches put an inordinate amount of energy, not, not just like energy. I mean, I think it deserves some energy, but I mean like when churches are in red hot pursuit of making sure that we look sound and feel on our website and social media and in our gatherings and in our digital presence, that we look, sound, and feel like everything else that feels cutting edge in culture today, I think we lose our edge. I think we actually, more importantly, lose the timeless gift that ecclesiologically the church has always intended to give to the world, which is not um, just another Christianized version of everything else people are oversaturated with in the digital age, but rather to offer people transcendence, 
In other words, to offer people an opportunity um, to not only experience, but to, in an embodied way, engage and embed themselves in a community that is transcendent, that transcends the sort of normative, everyday, pop culture, digital media stuff of life that they are really truly oversaturated with and um when we when we're just focused on like man does our instagram account hold up against all the like high-end instagram accounts that all the high-end products and organizations we, we like do, do they compare if that if that gets an inordinate amount of energy, I think we're asking the wrong questions. You know, my belief, and this is historical, this is not conjecture. When you look back on 2000 years of Christian church history, it seems clear to me, and you've done a lot of work on church history, Josh, so you can speak to this. It seems clear to me that those moments when the church has been most effective in impacting culture have been those moments when the church um, didn't stand as a derivative of culture, but stood in creative resistance as a disruption to culture. Mm. And I think, you know, for far too long, particularly in the digital age, our ecclesiology has gotten sort of like sucked into this vortex of needing to just like look, sound, and feel like the cool next thing on social media or something. And I'm not saying that's bad. Like, Good graphics and good aesthetics, I value those things. But that's not the stuff that's going to change people's lives and communities and entire societies. The stuff that's yeah. going to change them is like real transcendent, embodied stuff that cuts through the digital noise. And yeah. I just think, especially after COVID, we've got to lead into that even more. Yeah. Well, that's great. And I wonder, maybe you could speak a little too. There's a story that you shared in the, the book of a friend of yours. I think he was like an EDM musician, you know, and, and yeah. club it all. And then uh, coming to church, because I, I think not only from, hey, what should we as those who are leading in churches and all be striving to create, but even what do we as just people, followers of Jesus, what do we need? And some of the misperception, you know, could you share that story of your friend, kind of musician, yeah. and his observation? Because it sounds like you you mentioned you, you've actually heard similar comments that he made a lot. And maybe yeah. why? How does that speak to something that uh, embodied togetherness can bring yeah. that the yeah. hype slick whatever doesn't per se? <laughs> yeah, totally. I've got this friend named Jake. Um, he uh, he's in his late twenties now, but I met him when he was like fourteen or fifteen. He was like freshman in high school, and uh, always loved music. He was a part of our youth group, and then when he graduated high school, sadly, he sort of walked away from the church. But he's a super gifted musician, and he's actually bec- he's he's risen to prominence in the world of EDM, electronic dance music. Which, if you're not familiar, I, I don't listen to EDM, but it's like this giant subgenre of music. So I follow him on social media and he's like constantly, I mean, pre pandemic, he was like constantly posting photos of himself in China playing a festival with like 50,000, like literally 50,000 fans wow. in, in giant field out there. So he's like, I mean, he, he's like done a song with like the chain smokers and stuff. So he's like at the top of the EDM game towards mm. the world playing out these sold out shows and stuff. And um, sometimes when he, he lives in LA now, but sometimes when he comes back to, to San Jose to visit family, his family still goes to church. So he'll go to church with them. And a few years ago, he went to church with his family and they were going to this new church in town. Great people. I know the, the pastor there, great guys, just trying to reach, um, you know, young people in our area. And Jake was, he was describing the experience to me and he said he walked in and it was like, you know, and there's nothing intrinsically wrong with any of these things. But he said he walked in and it was like laser lights and a fog machine, a giant digital screen. And, um, you know, the music was like as loud as one of his concerts. And it was just like 808 beats and just it was crazy. And people were all hyped and it was just all dark in the room, all the lights on the stage, you know, kind of. It doesn't sound unfamiliar to us because there is a whole movement in kind of the evangelical church where that is the way we present church. And so he walked into one of those churches, very common experience. And then he was texting me afterwards, and he basically was saying, like, that church service reminded me of, like, a smaller scale version of one of my shows. So it was 
it was like uncannily relevant to his life. It looked, it felt very much like his everyday life. That's the kind of stuff he does professionally. So they, they, they hit the mark in terms of relevance, cultural relevance. But then he said to me, he was like, but dude, like, is that what churches are like these days? Cause I, I don't think he, verbatim what he texted me was, I don't think church should be like that. So I asked him to expound. And basically what he, what he essentially told me was, man, if I'm going to take the risk of going to a church, I'm doing it because I want to experience something that I don't experience everywhere else in my life. Mm -hmm. I want to go and be a part of something that quiets the noise of my life, that brings calm to the chaos of my every day, um, that brings a centeredness in the midst of all of the left and right push and pull of just my chaotic sort of uncontrolled, you know, um, day to day living. And I just thought that, that was profound. And so basically what it means is here's this young millennial in his late twenties, Gen Z, um, and he's taking a risk of going to a church. He's unchurched. He's like the target audience for most churches. Like, this is the guy we want to reach. And this church he goes to, again, great church, great leaders, but the way they had designed their worship service was designed, in fact, to reach him, but it actually undid the thing they were intending to do. It actually repelled him. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think there's a disconnect there for for many of us, myself included. I often think man, to reach these people, we got to do these things that they like and they relate to and X, Y, and Z. And in reality, I think what people are looking for um, when they when they show up to church or take the risk of showing up to church, being a part of a church, I think they're, whether they know it or not, they're looking for, again, transcendence, something that transcends the, the normal everyday chaos of their lives. And when it comes to digital church and embodied in the digital age, when the overwhelming majority of our days are spent staring at screens and typing with our thumbs, in some ways, I can't think of anything more transcendent than uh, a space and a community that invites you to put down the device and to stand shoulder to shoulder with other real human beings and their real stories and to be alive together and to be alive to one another uh, in in real ways. So um, I think that opportunity exists for all of us as, as churches. That's great, man. Well, it does strike me that, yeah, when you move to in person versus, you know, like you have less, uh, things are slower, like the pace is probably slower. Uh, lives are messier. <laughs> Interactions can be more fraught, you know, because that part of what the digital age has done. I think you used in your book, a couple of categories, like it makes things faster, like there's a speed, increases choice, like there's all the options available, uh, kind of the individualism of, you you know, being at the center heart of it and slowing things down where it's, it's actually, uh, it, it when we become acclimated to the speed and the choice and me being at the center of, you know, orchestrating everything just the way I want it to be with the best and the slickest, that may not actually be though what your soul really needs. You know, that, that, that may kind of be what culturally we're choosing, but what your soul really needs. And, and I'm curious, what would you say kind of theologically, can you give us a, a theology of embodiedness? Why, why kind of, um, why does Jesus care about, embodiedness you know what, what are can you give us some hooks kind of biblically or theologically on the significance or importance of uh embodied relationships life in our bodies that uh, you mentioned how science biologically a lot of those things are, are pointing out some of the dangers and impact that this last year has had on us just from so much of life being mediated through technology uh can you give us some theological hooks though on why it's not only maybe biologically scientifically important but even uh theologically matters Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, as we're recording this, we're coming off of Easter, you know, which was uh, just a week or two ago. And the 40 day season leading up to Easter, you know, Lent is such a strange Lent as we've been in, in the pandemic, we're on the tail end of it uh, here um, where where I am. And it's interesting, you know, you, you begin with Ash Wednesday where you receive the ashes and you receive that, uh, that startling reminder that we came from dust and to dust we're, we're going to return, you know, and uh, that, that takes us back to the beginning of the story when God um, takes dust, he takes dirt, like literally the stuff of earth and animates it by, mm-hmm. by his breath, you know, uh, you could say by his spirit, right? Mm-hmm. By his ruach. And, 
uh, man, there's so much power in that story. And um, the, the fact that the story, the human story begins with the animating work of God by his spirit, his very breath into the most, like literally the most mundane stuff of earth. Mm. Just dirt, you know? Mm. And God doesn't take like some epic cedar tree or, you know, he doesn't take like some, like he just takes the most boring, like the boringest thing you could think of and he animates it and brings it to life. And there is kind of embedded in that story um, what's, again, science and, and uh, biology has shown all along and is proving even more so after the pandemic. Like, we are the stuff of Earth. We're embodied creatures who've, who are animated by the Spirit of God, you know, God's breath in us. And as such, to ignore, um, to ignore that combination the animating work of God in the stuff of earth, like the actual physical stuff of earth that you can see and touch and taste and smell and all that um, is to lose some of our humanity. I, I really believe that to over digitize our experiences where it becomes so easy to just kind of fall deep into the vortex of non uh, uh, non-physical realities is to really truly lose a part of, of our humanity because to be human is to be embodied. You know, that's mm. um, undeniable. So, you know, you, you bring that all the way fast forward to the digital age and you said it, the digital age has these values, speed, choice, and individualism. And um, I, I talk about it a little bit in the book, but speed choice and individualism in and of themselves aren't necessarily bad, although you could argue that individualism maybe isn't, isn't you know, God's design. But if you take each of those values to their natural end when they're pushed to their extremes, and they have been pushed to their extremes, in my opinion, in the digital age, the speed makes us super impatient. Um, all of the choices make us really shallow. We never have to dig deep into anything. We just move on to the next option. And the individualism, social science is showing this uh, at an alarming rate. The individualism is making us incredibly isolated. Mm. And so the values have led us to becoming in the digital age of people who are grossly impatient, really shallow, and really, really isolated. The problem with that is discipleship to Jesus is lots of things, but primarily it, it's patient, it's a patient work, it's a deep work, and it's a communal work. Like discipleship to Jesus, formation into the human being that God has called us to be, um, it has values that actually stand in direct opposition to the, the sort of uh, results of the digital age. And um, I think that for us, you know, digital is here to stay. It's not going away. So for followers of Jesus, uh, theologically speaking, if we are truly going to follow Jesus, I think it matters a lot that we think about and consider carefully how um, our usage of digital technologies might be unforming and undoing discipleship to Jesus mm. in us. Um, wow. That's great. Yeah, I, I think even as you mentioned, the other side of Easter as well, like just the power of Jesus' resurrection is a reaffirmation of the body and the goodness of the created order and God's intent to redeem and restore bodily reality rather than to transcend it in some kind of um, way that negates or removes the significance of, of our embodied life. Uh, I think of the incarnation, Jesus, you know, the word becoming flesh, the birth of Jesus. And just the power, like, dude, God didn't send us a TikTok video. <laughs> you know, like, he took on flesh and, and, and like, actually stepped into our human condition and, and the power of Christ's movement to be to take that on, ultimately to suffer our affliction and to redeem and restore it through his resurrection. That's super powerful. I, I'm curious, you talked earlier about um, kind of Jamie Smith and liturgy and sort of the power, you know, how rhythms shape and form us, even in ways that are subconscious, maybe that we're not even recognizing. I, I did a sermon about a year ago. It was kind of earlier in COVID, but I drew on some of the research. Uh, Rebecca McLaughlin, she's got a, another good book. I'm um, trying to remember the like 12 Confronting questions. Christianity. Confronting Christianity. Yes. 12 yeah. questions, 10 questions, 12, something like that. But there's a great yeah. chapter in there. One of the first ones on 
something like why religion is good for you. Or so, you know, she's kind of confronting yeah. the idea that uh, you know, there's kind of a common myth out there that religion is bad for you. It, it makes you a worse person ethically and all, all these different things. And she ends up showing like all these stats, but some of the stats were on how kind of the effect of like, dude, if you attend church in person regularly, like on average three times a month or more, uh, like yeah. happier, healthier, wealthier, live longer, like all these crazy health effects, like dude, something like, uh, I think that one of the claims is something to the effect of like, it, it would do you better, it would, does you as much good health wise to go to church regularly as it does to stop smoking, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. like, and I'm curious if you have any thoughts on why, like as you've looked a lot at kind of digital online present versus actually embodied gathering in person, those rhythms, those liturgies of gathering together, Beyond even just, did I get some specific out of it that I'm going to remember six weeks later? How does that gathering as the people of God maybe shape and form us in ways that we might not be conscious of that are actually significant to our life as a follower of Jesus, being formed as a follower of Jesus? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, yeah, in secular psychology, there, there's this, I, I, I'm forgetting off the top of my head who, who was it. It's like a famous psychologist. I've heard it cited multiple times but they talk about how there's these like five things that all and this is secular research five things that um all uh all happy people seem to share in common uh in, in an overwhelming way and it's like things like family and friendship but one of the things so fascinating is faith that like most people who register in the top 10 percentile of happiness and satisfaction with their life all have this thing where the, the anchor of their life is not um, on self and it's on, again, to use the same word, it's on a transcendent reality, a belief in something that is much larger, much bigger than themselves. You know, and it's one of the reasons why like, the richest people in the world end up once they like reach the pinnacle and they just have everything and all the money, almost all of them exclusively just give it away. <laughs> it's just like, you know, and, and what they'll tell you in interviews and stuff, I mean, sometimes they wax poetic about making the world a better place and, and they certainly are doing that. But like, if you read between the lines, almost all of them, what you hear from them is like, Oh, I, this is the thing that makes me most happy now is not like accumulating more but giving it away and not just recklessly giving it away, but giving it away in such a way that they feel connected to something happening in the world that's bigger than they are. And so I think all of that stuff speaks to, again, secular uh, science would call it biology. Followers of Jesus would call it um, the Imago Dei and as God has made us a particular way uh, it, and in, in his image, in the image of a relational God, the Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and I think so when it comes to our ecclesiology, um, you know, there's a reason why Paul and the other writers, uh, New Testament writers in particular, use family language to describe the church. You know, why? Like we, we have semantic satiation now. So when somebody says like, oh, we're brothers and sisters in Christ, it's just like, it doesn't mean that much. We're just like, oh yeah, that's just, you know, that's what Christians do. They call each other, you're my brother in Christ. You're my sister in Christ. But, you know, when we go back to like Paul's world, that, that was like a really provocative thing to say. And it, and it had it had pragmatic impact on their everyday lives. The fact that, Paul's calling them to live as brothers and sisters. There's that super, um, it reads very strangely, but Paul has this little section in one of his letters to the Corinthians where he basically is like, he's writing to the Corinthian Christians and he's like, hey, why are you guys suing each other? You shouldn't sue each other, you know, and all these unbelievers are watching you. You don't sue each other. It's a family matter. And for us with like modern Western eyes, that passage reads very strangely, like, Oh, Paul's against suing. I guess Christians shouldn't sue. And maybe that's true. But but what he's really doing there is like in the ancient Greco-Roman world, taking people to court over lawsuits was like pretty common practice. But there was only one there was only one relationship where the courts in the ancient Greco-Roman world wouldn't try your case. And that was when siblings who shared the same father tried to sue each other mm. because socially back then, um, if you shared the same father, like siblings who shared the same father 
That was the most important and highly elevated social bond in all of society, way more than like a husband and a wife. Like siblings had the same father. That, that was the unbreakable, that's the most important relational bond. And so when Paul says, hey, you guys are brothers and sisters, you can't sue each other, mm. he's talking about a pragmatic ramification of mm. being brothers and sisters. Essentially, Family. Paul is saying, when I tell you you're brothers and sisters who share the same God in heaven, I'm not talking, I'm not talking poetically. You are literally brothers and sisters. And what that means is your actual real lived lives have to express that new reality for an unbelieving world. So come full circle now <clears throat> to ask the question like, you know, why does embodied matter? And there's, again, you've cited some of the research and the, the data and the science behind it. But like, think about when I travel and I FaceTime my family. It's like, <clears throat> I, lo I love the gift of digital because I can see them even while I'm away. But what sort of dad would you think I was if I told you, you know, this one time I was on a trip to Colorado and I FaceTimed my kids and my wife and it was really good. Like the Wi-Fi quality was good. It was high def. And I realized, you know, this is way easier than living with them. Like, <laughs> like, cause they make a mess and you know, so it's not, I have digital, so I'm just going to like, I'll just live here in Colorado and I'll just Wi-Fi. you know, I have Wi-Fi. I'll just FaceTime them every day. You'd be like, Oh, you're a horrible father and you need help because what it does at its best when it comes to family is like, it makes me yearn to be with them. It makes me yearn to fly back home and hold my real family in my real arms. And so it is with the church. But sometimes we argue and we're like, well, that's, that's my family, but you're just talking about church. And then come back to Paul's words. Well, though we may not feel like our church is family in that way, that is the calling. That's the bar that's set before us. We've got we've to act our way toward that feeling. And so, um, yeah, I'm with you, man. I think gathering together is a way in which we are formed into the family of God, the way God intends us to be. Even if we don't feel like it right away, we act our way toward that feeling. That's great. Yeah. I've, I've wondered at times if we have, uh, yeah, if one of the dangers is, it seems like, I don't know the timeline of this, but it seems like it, there's been in recent history, this last century or whatever, where many churches, Protestant in particular, you know, like we've set ourselves up as almost like the primary reason that you gather as God's people is to get some teaching, right? Like it's kind of like, I imagine back in the day, it's like, okay, pastor's been to Bible school or been to, you know, seminary, something like he's got the knowledge, the insider knowledge. And so the reason that you go is you don't have that knowledge. You go and you, you get, you get the Bible knowledge. And I think one of the challenges is if that's your, view of church, which culturally we as churches have been kind of guilty of, I think kind of setting that up in some ways, but then suddenly like in digital podcast age, like, dude, I can, I can, I can download a better talk or I can get access to free seminar. I can get like, I can get all those things. If the purpose of the gathered people of God, if the purpose of the church is to get the talk, to get the information. Well, now it's like, dude, I can get that all over the map, you know, yeah. like I get it anywhere. And I do find it, you know, in a lot of other traditions where, say, the sacraments are, there's a much higher vision of the sacraments, particularly of yeah. communion, the Eucharist, you know, and baptism and going like, dude, you can't download the Eucharist. You know, like, you can't, you can't. Uh, and, and I wondered, too, like, whether there's something to, like, gathering as God's people with themes like word and sacrament and worship, going and being a community where it's going, it's not just like a TED talk of getting some information, but it's more like, dude, we're gathering as a people, as a community that's in covenant and life together as family, as brother and sister, we're gathering at kind of the family table or the family living room around our father's word, you know, around Christ's word. Like we're actually sitting, gathering together. And even at times, if I don't remember all the specifics of every sermon later on, you know, there's something about gathering as the family of God around God's word together and sitting under it, placing ourselves under his authority and his life and his presence and receiving that and doing so in a posture of worship where we're actually together, we're singing his praises, we're declaring aloud, we're using our bodies with raised arms and voices expressed, you know, and all that, like to, to worship him. And we're gathering around uh, the sacraments, like around, dude, Jesus has identified his presence with these tangible, physical things that you can't download, you know, and, and like whether there is a not whether there's, I want to be bold of that, say that there is, there is a shaping formation that occurs 
in the rhythms like that as the gathered people of God uh, yeah. that shape and form us as a particular people. Um, that yeah. and to, as you said, yeah. uh, the social yeah. science, it works. It actually, it does actually yeah. work. Yeah. It does something. <laughs> To you. Yeah, I'm with you 100%. I have a short little section in my book about um, communion, about the Eucharist. And I say, I mean, I, I was doing a, a bunch of research trying to write the short little section. And the conclusion I came to is that um, the biblical invitation, the gospel invitation is to eat and drink our way into the family of God. Mm. Not to not to primarily learn our way in or to sing our way in, although that that is a, a tremendous part of it, um, or to even serve our way in. Those are all expressions for sure. But the primary means, I think, is to eat and drink our way in. You know, when when Jesus says, "Every time you gather, do this, do this, eat and drink." you know, in remembrance of me. I, I do think it's really significant, Josh, that Christ leaves us a meal, you mm -hmm. know? He leaves us lots of things. So uh, listen, you and I both know we, we, we have a very high view of preaching and of worship. And um, although worship itself is a much larger word than just singing, but we have a high view of singing and music and all those things. But, you know, I, I do think that's one of the things we've lost. Like at our church, um, the church where I'm on staff now, we have not had a rhythm of taking communion every week. It's been like, a, you know, communion Sunday, once a month kind of rhythm. And we're moving toward every time we gather, we're going to eat and drink. We're, we're starting to do that now, you know, and um, there's something visceral about eating and drinking, like to taste it, you know, and to hold it. There's just a, there's a visceral sort of thing. And, and I don't want to overemphasize it, you know, and to, to spiritualize it in a way that's dangerous or, or unhealthy. But that also then expands to like singing together and stuff. There's a lot of science that shows that even singing together is like so good for mm -hmm. your health and for relationships and for bonding. And, and I think we could all relate to that. So yeah, I'm right there with you for sure. Yeah. Well, it also makes me think, I'm curious your thoughts on this, is that like, it struck me in the past that word and sacrament, kind of gathering together around God's word, around sacrament in the spirit, you know, like uh, gathered together in the spirit of God, that those are both things that you receive, not so much that you do or initiate, like there's a receptive posture kind of. And what struck me is um, over the years, if we believe that grace is it's about God's pursuit of us rather than, you know, our, it's more about God's pursuit of us and then it's starting with our pursuit of God, you know, like he, he initiates with us, comes after us. Then it seems like those rhythms also kind of implicitly cultivate an awareness of like, dude, we're on the receiving end. Like we're receiving God's pursuit of us through his word, through his sacrament, through his spirit, through his presence, through his people. Um, and something about that gathering regularly in person doing that. And, and I, I'm curious your thoughts here. Like one of the things I've noticed over the last 20 years or so in ministry is it feels like there are different movements where, we want to take the fruit and have it replace the root. If it makes it like we want to take some of the impact of that and have it become primary. So in my younger years, like the missional movement was the big one. It's like kind of underemphasized, well, word and sacrament gathering Sunday, like that's, our, that's just kind of ritual routine, but let's be around the real thing is mission. Let's go out and serve people and get in the city and do all that, which is all good. I think that should flow out of word and sacrament and all. But what I saw was it, it, it over time, a lot, a lot of the movement could kind of become, disconnected from word and sacrament. It was almost like, dude, the gathering of God's people, Sunday church just got, got, got dismissed and eventually left behind in a, in a number of circles. And like, um, and those ended up going some really unhealthy directions, you know, and so I felt like later there's another moon. Well, okay. It's not, it's not mission. It's community. Like we just all need to be in like super tight, intimate, like doing life together, life on life. And that usually meant you had to like all move in as roommates and, you know, share each other's, I don't know, baths and children and I'm not, you know like do your kids baths for them. like like there was a very high bar of what it meant to be in community together but almost like then that replaced word and sacrament and that went some unhealthy directions and then you had now i think maybe today i see it's more like uh some of the spiritual formation like the practices and like th those kind of things where it's like dude the disciplines and the practices and reclaiming that but uh, a lot of the crowd some of the crowd I know in those circles, like, too, that's become often its own replacement. Like, ah, uh, this is the real Christianity kind of thing, you know? And my sense is, dude, healthy, the healthy life of the people of God, it should flow into 
worship. I mean, it should flow into mission. It should flow into community. It should flow into uh, practices, discipleship, all this, a lot of it. But all those seem to be emphasizing things that we do, you know, and there seems to be something that God's just ordained about gathering together with a starting point of receiving, like receiving from his word, receiving from his sight, receiving from his spirit, his presence together as his gathered people that has to be foundational. And if you pluck away from that root, the fruit's eventually going to wither and probably not. Dude, that that's so, that's so good, man. That's so insightful. Um, such a great synopsis. I haven't even thought about it sort of at that scale, but as I hear you say it, yeah, I think you're, I think you're exactly right. And in some ways it, it, it gets back to the whole, you know, seeking transcendence. Cause I think a part of, uh, transcendence when we talk about, um, you know, holiness might be another way to describe, uh, uh, transcendence, um, in the Christian worldview, there is, there is a timelessness to it. Like it's not caught up in it. And I don't think any of those things are necessarily fads like the missional movement community or the practices. Um, but there, there is like, there is a sort of exhaustion that comes about one as a Christian and two as, as a church leader for sure in sort of the constant rat race of like, well, what's the next, what's the next movement that's going to save the church? You know, like everything's falling apart. What's the next thing that's going to save the church? And the church doesn't need saving, you know, um, <laughs> not even the gates of hell will, will prevail. And so uh, I, I love that thought that um, these are all good things that are uh, expressions and results of, uh, of, of the anchored things. And I think you're right. I, I don't have really anything to add to that other than to say, like, I, I think it's so good. And now it's giving me all sorts of food for thought. I, I've got to like go reassess everything now. <laughs> so, that's so good, man. Oh man. Well, Jay, I, I want to be respectful of your time. You know, I know you've got a lot of things going on, but maybe the last, last question to you, man, I, I'd be curious. One would be, you know, what are your, some of your hopes? Like as you look at uh, the other side of COVID, where, wherever that's going to be in different parts of the country, different churches, that's going to be maybe different in terms of timestamp of when, when that happens. But as we're kind of seeing vaccination roll out, people are beginning to regather more, those things are picking up. Um, trajectory, what's sort of your hope for, uh, maybe give, give, give us your hope as well as any concerns, you know, like, like coming out of this last season that we've been in as it relates to analog versus digital church, you know, like, like what, what are some of your hopes and are there any concerns you have as well that we might want to, as followers of Jesus, kind of be wary of some of the concerns and, and be on a trajectory moving towards some of the, the hopes? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my greatest concern is that this past year has, again, um, you know, unformed and reformed us in ways that are going to be hard to reverse for, for a lot of people. That, that's my greatest concern is that we've been so habituated into seeing church as a digital product to consume. And it's really not people's fault. Like, it's very hard to feel like a digital service you're watching is a people to whom you belong. Cause when it's just on your screen, it's, it, it is by its nature being conveyed as a digital product for you to consume. Cause everything else we see on our screens is exactly that. And uh, there's this, um, you know, social commentator, philosopher, 20th century guy, Marshall McLuhan is famous for coining this phrase um, the medium is the message. And he was sort of confronting the age old adage that, you know, the, the mediums change, but the message stays the same. You know, we've all heard that. And McLuhan basically says, no, 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 no. The medium you use is the message you are conveying. And uh, you could argue how true that is for sure, but there is definitely some significant amount of truth in that. Um, that when we watch stuff on our screens, it's hard to get around the fact that we are experiencing a consumer experience. We're consuming content or a product. And that's been our church experience for the past year. And so my concern is that we have um, it, it, mentally and emotionally and even physiologically sort of 
acquiesced to that temporary reality and that we've be- begun to believe that that's what church is. The church is a product to consume. Getting back to your point is like, well, you know, I found this church on the other side of the country and I love the preaching. So that's my church now. Or I've, you know, I, I didn't know that Tim Keller had a podcast of his sermons. So I just listened to those on Sundays because they're way better than Jay's sermons. And they are. And it's like, well, that's my church now. But it comes back to what you're saying, you know, well, the church was never built on my preaching or Josh's preaching or anyone's preaching. It's built on the word of God and the sacraments and the community of God's people who become your family over time. But I think uh, my concern is that we've lost that and that we, we just think church is, is content. And I'm just going to find the best content because that's the best church because church is content. So that's my concern. But my hope is that coupled with that has been an utter uh, loss of joy for so many of us, myself included. In fact, Josh, that was the most surprising thing about um, that was the most surprising thing about COVID for me. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty introverted. Uh, I really like being with, you know, one or two other friends, you know, over good food and good drink. And, but man, get me in a room with lots of people. And my, my natural tendency is to shrivel into a corner and like, not, nah, you know, and so I thought when we hit the pandemic, I was like, this is going to be great. <laughs> I'll just be like, home, be quiet, chilling yeah. out. <laughs> be isolated. it's going to be awesome. And it was, it wasn't even like a month into it. And I, I was like wondering why I felt so off. And what I realized was that I had lost joy. And I don't mean like mo- sparks of happiness. I mean like an underpinning of joy in my life. And um, the writer, David Brooks, he's got this uh, great quote. He says in his book, uh, The Second Mountain, I think, he says, I'll never forget this quote. He says, joy is when the skin barrier between two people um, is removed and you feel the transcendent reality of becoming one. Mm. And I realized that that's what was happening at church, even though I was tired on Sundays after being with, you know, several hundred people or whatever, it's like there was joy, like there was joy beneath the exhaustion. And it's because I was with others in worship around word and sacrament singing um, to our God and father together. And there's like something that is just irreplaceable, that sort of reality and the rhythm of that reality. So Mm -hmm. I'm hopeful Uh, Because it feels like for most people, that loss has been quite visceral and and there is an awareness of that. I'm hopeful that um, people will tap into that, be able to name that and realize that um, returning to church uh, as much as possible, as much as one is able, um, is one of the ways in which uh, we will will be replenished, essentially, and m- more importantly, be formed again into the people of God together, and experience the fullness of life um, as we as we're formed together. So I'm hopeful that we're headed that way, and I'm hopeful because I'm seeing that at our church as we've begun regathering uh, in the last month or so. Um, I've seen, man, I can't tell you how many tears I've seen mm. in people's eyes as they've just sung together or said hello in the courtyard. I mean, these small, simple things, you know, and it gets back to some of what you were saying earlier. It's like the preaching has kind of been removed. There has not been a whole lot of like, man, I'm so glad I came. That sermon was awesome. There hasn't been much of that. (laughs) There's been a whole lot of, Oh, I needed this. Mm. Not the sermon necessarily. I needed all of this. Yeah. Worship in the community of God's people together, hearing one another, seeing one another, um, and knowing that we're not alone. And uh, so I'm hopeful that that um, we're, we're going to continue to head in that direction in the coming months and years. That's cool, man. Great. Well, before you go, Jay, just to, again, give a shout out to folks to check out Analog Church is a great book, uh, man, on definitely why we need real people and things and places in the, in the digital age. Uh, Analog Church is awesome. On it goes deeper into some of the stuff we've been talking about. But before we go, Jay, also you're working on a new project. Could you give us a little window into what's coming up next? 
Yeah, yeah. As uh, I've got a couple couple writing projects in the works. Um, Josh and I were actually this was a life dream of mine yes. to be in a, in a book with Josh, and so we were <laughs> both in a book together that just came out called "Before You Lose Your Faith," and uh, so that was really fun. But um, totally, a yeah. quick set note on that. That's for folks who are wrestling with deconstruction or you know uh, some of the tough questions around the faith, and so we've each got a chapter in that. But that's looking like a great resource if you or someone you know is kind of processing and wrestling through tough questions uh, regarding the faith or kind of in some of the deconstruction process. It's published uh, at TGC, kind of put the Gospel Coalition, kind of put that together and was stoked yeah. to be able to, us to be a part of that together. Yeah. yeah. Tell us about the, the other one you're working on. Yeah, yeah. I'm working on a book uh, called Analog Christian. That's the working title. So it's sort of a follow-up of sorts. And all I, it's very simple premise. All I'm trying to do is um, explore... Uh, it's, it, this is a personal book. The first book was really about the church and our ecclesiology in the digital age. This book is just really about trying to faithfully follow Jesus and specifically cultivate the fruit of the spirit in our lives um, as antidotes to so much of the, um, the, the, so many of the symptoms of the digital age. So love instead of self-centric despair and joy instead of comparison, peace instead of contempt and on mm-hmm. and on. So my, my prayer for this book is that it's, it's helpful for us as we consider sort of the inner workings of our lives and how mangled do they become because of our sort of proclivity to lose ourselves to our phones and then to lean into the spirit of God and to ask him to cultivate that good fruit in us um, so that we could be, you know, good news people in, in a news in a world full of bad news. So awesome. Go. So good. Well, I can't wait for that. Jay, thank you for being with us. Thanks to all you listening and look forward Jay to hopefully seeing you in person sometime before too long again. And to all of you listening, look forward to hopefully seeing you Redemption Tempe crowd in person uh, for those who can be, not not online, but in person for those who are able to. uh, Looking forward to seeing y'all here soon. Thanks for listening to this episode of the All of Life podcast. To get more information on Redemption Church Tempe, you can download the Redemption Tempe app or you can send an email to tempe at redemptionaz.com.